Good evening, and thank you for joining us for NGO Monitor's annual conference, Fairer Leaders as Human Rights Activists Exposing the Facade. My name is Olga Deutsch, and I am NGO Monitor's Vice President. Kak Hanuka Sameach. The choice to hold our annual conference today was not a coincidence. 10th of December is marked as the International Human Rights Day, so it seemed most appropriate to address this important issue today. Joining us for opening remarks is Ambassador Noam Katz, Minister of Public Diplomacy at the Embassy of Israel in Washington, DC. Prior to this, Mr. Katz served as Director of the Public Affairs Department for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Ambassador of Israel to Nigeria, Ghana, and the Economic Community of West African States. I will give you a heads up that immediately following Noam's address, we will then hear from Professor Gerald Steinberg, founder and president of NGO Monitor. Gerald created the organization in 2002, and already then he had the vision to flag an entire area that was missing from research and from the broader discourse. We are proud of what NGO Monitor has grown to be and of our amazing team. We owe it all to Gerald's leadership. And with this, Noam, it is an honor to have you with us. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. My camera is, uh, is not on, but I hope that you hear me. Uh, do you hear me? We do. OK. Uh, first, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here with you. And I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Gerald Steinberg, the uh, president of NGO Monitor and the entire NGO Monitor staff uh, for this annual conference. Uh, it is uh, an important opportunity for all those who are working tirelessly uh, to defend the state of Israel and to defend truth. Uh, when I think uh, about this opportunity, it's a great opportunity for, oh, thank you. Now I see myself as well. Uh, it's a great opportunity uh, for all of us to exchange views and expertise and best practices. Today, today conference focus on the exposure of civil society organizations that sophisticatedly camouflage and hide the true nature, ideology, and goals that are aiming at the destruction of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. Uh, some of these organizations are directly linked to terror organizations. Some of these are part of the ring that can be described as antisemitic by the IRA definition. Unfortunately, some of these organizations are also enjoying European financial support and moral support. Research, public diplomacy, legal action, and diplomacy, all of them has a role in exposing them, those organizations. One of the main issues that diplomacy is focused on today is developing a discourse of criterions that will help us and will help our counterparts in other states to be able to identify the true nature of these organizations. Uh, we believe, we strongly believe that this is also an interest, shared interest based on values uh, of those countries that some of them are being misled in their action. And we believe that they have no interest in supporting organizations that are linked or, or connected to terror organization. And we truly believe that those countries are committed to the security and well being of Israel, Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people. We have a long journey, it's a struggle on hearts and minds. It's a discourse that has a moral value as well as practical one. Uh, we have some achievement. We need more. We need much more. Today is Hanukkah, 
And Hanukkah is a holiday of, uh, of miracles and light. But we don't need miracles, I think, that we need hard labor, hard work, and that will allow the truth to shine. So I wish all of us a happy Hanukkah and happy holidays and happy new year ahead of us. And I look forward to hear and listen uh, to the rest of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Katz. The uh, goals that you set and the description that you provided uh, set a very high bar and we hope that we can live up to that. The elements that you described, they're all very much part of the efforts that we need to focus on. And we're very glad and privileged to work with some of the outstanding uh, Israeli government officials like yourself and others to provide the information and to get feedback. I also wanna thank everybody that's been involved with NGO Monitor and in putting on this conference, our guest speakers. It's not easy to do the, you don't have to get on a plane to do these, uh, I would say trips or these, these activities, but you do have to make yourself available under uh, very difficult circumstances at, at odd hours. And I wanna thank everybody for agreeing to participate in this important conference. And hopefully next year we'll be able to do this together without masks or with uh, perhaps minimal social distancing. The NGO Monitor team, this is not a one-man show by any means. We've been doing this now for 18 years. And I admit that when I started, I did not expect that this would last more than two or three years, that I would shine some uh, research light on the, the NGO role in what's called soft power, and particularly in the uh, focusing, the obsessive focus on Israel and move on to other things. But with a, an amazing team of researchers and people who work with NGO Monitor in different formats. And Olga presented a very, uh, an amazing opening to the work that we do and, and thank you. The, uh, th this has become very much of a, a much deeper project. Each year that we dig deeper, we find more and more of the role that NGOs play and the, the need to do due diligence, to research, to provide the information of the activities of these NGOs and to inform their funders. And very often when the funders fail to know, to recognize what they are supporting and the scale that it, that it takes, it's important to provide that information and that's our major role. This year's focus of the NGO Monitor Conference, a lot of our work over the past year has focused on the role of organizations, non-governmental organizations, or as Europeans prefer to say, civil society organizations, that are substantially linked to terrorism. Palestinian groups in particular that have received large amounts of money from European, European governments over the years in which we're talking about close to $50 million, $46 million that we have traced. And there's probably more that we have not been able to trace yet from Europe, primarily European governments that go to up to 11 or 12 organizations, depending on exactly how we count them, that have very clear ties to terror organizations, but primarily to the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. As a research organization, what we do is we provide the evidence, we find the evidence. And we have an amazing team of people who look, we don't look, we don't get secret information, but rather the information is out there. It has to be looked for. And when you see individuals, when we find individuals who are both high level officials, heads of Palestinian NGOs that are called human rights groups that have United Nations recognition as organizations that can participate in the Human Rights Council and many other places. And they have direct ties to terrorism because we see how do we do this? Our staff looks at the heads of these organizations and then finds the same people are active. They have military ranks or terrorist ranks with these organizations that are part of the PFLP terror network. We've identified so far over 80 such individuals in these NGOs. Some of them run the organizations, some of them run the finances and deal with European officials. 
get millions of dollars every year, millions of euros every year, millions of kronas every year. These are not issues that are hidden, but we see it's the same individuals and they post their pictures, their videos of PFLP events on Facebook, on Twitter, on social media in different ways. We were told when we first began this research a few years ago, and one at a time we began to find the organizations and see the individuals. We were told very often by European officials that the PFLP is no longer an active terror organization. That instead they are a political, political party, they're part of the PLO, but they don't do active terrorism anymore. And yet the more we dig, the more we find that these people are in fact active in murder, in killing, in recruiting. The terror organizations, as the Israeli court, Supreme Court once said about one of the leaders of one of these organizations, a human rights activist by day and a terrorist by night, Jekyll and Hyde. We've identified 80 individuals like that. And they are very, very active in terror attacks, unfortunately. One of our guests tonight, one of our speakers is Rabbi Eitan Schnerb, who I'll introduce at the end of my presentation. When he and his son and daughter were hiking last year in August, they were attacked, they were killed by a bomb that had been planted and operated by remote control by members of PFLP, five of whom are now arrested and standing trial. And we're also high level officials of an organization called Union of Agriculture Work Committee. I'm just gonna present a few examples. Now what's important in this is that this organization is funded by European governments. This organization gets millions of euros and dollars every year from governments like the Netherlands. And here we have a picture taken of some of these individuals, some of these members of the PFLP terror group, who are also officials of the Union of Agricultural Work Committees, which is supposed to be, which is being supported in order to develop Palestinian agriculture, particularly in Gaza. Did the Dutch officials who provided these millions and for many years, were they aware of the terror connections? They claim not to have been. Dutch Minister for International Aid a few months ago was embarrassed getting up in parliament in response to questions about this and saying, we have now determined that our money paid the salaries for these people, these murderers, she didn't use that term. And we're suspending the funding pending an investigation. Had she listened to NGO Monitor, they could have reached that conclusion at least a year earlier. And we sent numerous letters all of this is the part of the way, it illustrates the ways that we work. Now, the research that we do doesn't just sit on people's, in people's inboxes. We make sure that the governments that fund these organizations are aware of what they're funding. Perhaps they don't have the resources. Perhaps they don't have the personnel to be able to do the research that NGO Monitor does. It's a little bit hard to understand why the government of the Netherlands or the European Union here we have the commissioner for neighborhood policy who said when learning about the way in which the EU was funding a lot of these organizations based on NGO monitor research, said ordered an investigation to ensure that EU financial support does not go to terrorists or to terrorist organizations. We're awaiting the results of that investigation. We already know the evidence is quite clear. So if we look at the broad picture, we see how the research that NGO Monitor does is both an example of the importance of, of, of looking closely, of doing due diligence at the NGOs that are being funded. If the NGOs are clean, then the governments fund them and they do the work that they're supposed to do. If they're linked to terrorism, or they promote anti-Semitism, 
racism, campaign for discriminatory boycotts, and these are all part of the same package. Governments have to face the consequences and take that seriously. I hope that next year we will have a different theme, that this issue will be tackled seriously in Europe. We've seen more and more indications of that. And again, I want to congratulate my colleagues at NGO Monitor, without whom this important work would not have been done. I now have duty and the honor to introduce Rabbi Eitan Schnirb. Rabbi Schnirb has spent two years as an educator. He's a pioneer who's worked in the undeveloped area of the city of Lod in a um, what's called the Garin Toani, a group of, of activists who are promoting education, religious programming, and social programming in an underdeveloped area of the city of Lod. He was there with son and daughter back in August when the PFLP carousel, and again, we're talking about people who were funded by European governments ostensibly to promote international development, human rights. Today, we mark Human Rights, International Human Rights Day. Rabbi Schnurb has agreed to join us today, and I thank him very much for participating. שהשפיע איתם את הרוצח, הוא גם 
אחד מהבכירים בארגון החקלאי של הרשות הפלסטינאית. והכספים האלה עברו, ואני שואל מאיפה הכספים האלו, מאיפה הם הגיעו, אדם לא מקבל סתם ככה פתאום מאה אלף דולר לכיס שלו. זה מגיע מאיפה שתראו, וזה כנראה מגיע מכל מיני אירועים באירופה. אני זועק את הדם של הבת שלנו, רינה, מימן כספים שהגיעו לאנשים האלה, זה לא הגיע מהעבודה שלהם. בבניין או במשהו אחר, הם לא עבדו והם עברו את הכספים האלה, זה הגיע מבחוץ הכספים האלה, זה הגיע לדם של הבת שלי שראיתי אותו, דרך אגב, את, ה- את הילדה שלי רימנה, אני הייתי בפיגוע ואני נפצעתי, את הבן שלי נפצע קשה מאוד, הלכתי לרינה ואני לא צוחק, ראיתי את כל הדם שלה זרוק על הרצפה עד כדי כך שהיה קשה לזהות אותה בלי דם בכלל, ואת הדם הזה זה כספים שהגיעו, אין ספק בכלל. אני בשנייה הראשונה ידעתי את זה. אני רוצה לספר לכם משהו קטן על הדמות של רינה, שכאהבה כל אדם, היא, היא הקפידה לא להתעסק בפוליטיקה, היא שנאה את הפוליטיקות, את הדברים האלה, היא כל הזמן אמרה לנו, כל הזמן, גם באולפנה שלה, שרצו להתעסק עכשיו בפוליטיקה, היא אמרה לא, היא אהבה, היא אהבה כל אדם באשר הוא אדם, היא כל כך אהבה לעשות חסד, היא כל כך אהבה לחשוב על החיים, היא כל כך אהבה אה, אה, ללמוד, ואיזה אור היה לה בפנים, איזה שמחה, איזה ילדה מקסימה כל כך, איזה ילדה מדהימה. המחבלים האלה שקיבלו את הצ'קים, אני לא צוחק, אלה שצולמו עם הצ'קים מממשלת הולנד, ראו את רינה ומשקפת, אני לא צוחק, הם ראו את רינה ומשקפת ורצחו אותה בדם קר, ורינה היא ילדה שכל כך אהבה לעשות חסד לעולם, אני שואל אתכם עכשיו, מגיע להם כספים בכלל, או לחברים שלהם? אף אחד לא התנער מהפיגוע הזה. תשאלו בבקשה את כל הארגונים של אדם, האם הם מתנערים מהפיגוע הזה? הם לא מתנערים, וגם כלפי חוץ. היינו היום בבית משפט, תראו איך הם מדברים, הם לא מתנערים מהפיגועים, הם לא מתנערים מהדבר הזה. לא מגיע להם כספים, אני שואל אתכם באמת, כאילו, בואו נתעורר, אולי תשארו כספים לארגונים עכשיו, שעושים באמת חסד, עושים באמת דברים טובים. אם הם באמת עושים חסד, תראו לאיפה הכספים הולכים, ריבונו של עולם. תחשבו כל פעם שאתם מעבירים כספים על רינה ו- ועל הקשר הזה, שעכשיו הוכח בוודאות שזה מגיע לרוצחים, וזה כבר לא שאלה, זה המשפט שלהם, רק אם נתחיל עכשיו, אבל הם כבר הואשמו והם ישבו בכלא כל החיים, אני מקווה שיותר מזה, אז בבקשה, בואו נתעורר כולנו. נגיע למסקנה שבאמת הכספים הם טובים, אבל הם צריכים להגיע למטרות הטובות באמת, לעם ישראל, לעשות טוב. לא משנה עכשיו עם ישראל או לא, אבל לא יכול להיות שמעבירים כספים עכשיו, לא לרשות הפלסטינאית, ולא לכל ארגוני זכויות אדם, שהם, שמישהו מהם אי פעם מתעסק בטרור, זה לא יכול להיות דבר כזה. בעזרת השם, אני מקבל בשורות טובות, ואני מזמין את כולם גם ללוד, מי שרוצה. לבוא לדבר עם המשפחה, גם מאירופה וגם מזה, אנחנו בעד, אנחנו בעד כולם, אנחנו גם ניצולי שואה, אנחנו משפחה של ניצולי שואה בעצמנו, והסטארטים שלנו איבדו את כל המשפחה שלהם בשואה, לא בשביל שהילדים שלנו ימותו מכספים של אירופה, אלא הקמנו פה דברים טובים. בשביל שנתחיל לשאול נכון ויותר, ויותר, ויותר נכון ויותר אמיתי, אז אני מזמין את כולם אלינו, ובעזרת השם אני מקווה מאוד שהמסר יעבור, יחלחל, ומעכשיו לא יעברו הכספים האלה. תודה רבה. תודה רבה, רבי. 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 And with this, we make a very, very sharp uh, shift to the first panel, but it might not be a, a bad introduction into the, the difficult topic that we wish to discuss. 
Our panel is titled Pouring Aid, NGOs, and Terror Ties, Reshaping the Policy. It is, known, it is a known fact that NGOs operating in conflict-ridden areas can be particularly vulnerable for terror infiltration and abuse. For this reason, many wonder if they are best equipped to supply humanitarian aid and deal with human rights in conflict zones around the world. Let's look at a few examples. In February this year, the EU's anti-fraud body, OLAF, examining EU-funded projects in Syria, found evidence of corruption by two former staff of an NGO providing humanitarian aid in Syria. Over the years, the UK Charity Commission investigated a number of NGOs over their diversion of charitable funds to terror or terror-related activities in Turkey, Syria, etc. Only last week, the French government shut down a well-known NGO claiming to fight Islamophobia, CCIF, in France for creating an atmosphere, and I quote, um, of hate, discrimination, and anti-Semitism and for spreading conspiracy theories. In the Palestinian context, we remember the World Vision scandal in 2016 over alleged diversion of 50 million US dollars in charity funds to Hamas. And only today, the Israeli radio, Galei Tzal, uh, shared the story that the German and the French government uh, have given a human rights award to the frontman of a Palestinian NGO, Al Mezan, an NGO with proven ties to the US EU designated terror organization, PFLP, and an organization that is leading a fight against Israel at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. At the same time, according to OECD, in 2018, 21 billion US dollars in official development aid was distributed to and through NGOs by 30 development countries. That is 15% of total global development aid. That is how important the civil society is in the context of humanitarian aid and human rights. We will try today to answer a very difficult question. How do we strike a balance between empowering civil society, encouraging their role, and on the other hand, ensuring that this incredible mandate and funds that they are given are not deliberately or unknowingly abused? I'm extremely honored to introduce to you our distinguished panelists tonight, Bonnie Glick, Ambassador Dani Ayalon, and member of the European Parliament, Nicholas Herbst. Bonnie is a senior advisor to the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies in Washington, DC, where she deals with strategic issues, including 5G, digital, digital transformations, the Abraham Accords, and the COVID-19 response worldwide. In January 2019, she was unanimously confirmed by the Senate to serve as the Deputy Administrator and Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Agency for International Development from January 2019 to November 2020. One of Glick's duties at USAID was serving as the Senior Agency Vetting Officer to ensure that U.S. government funds were not inadvertently transferred to organizations that support terror. Ambassador Danny Ayalon is the president of Odd Ayalon LTD, a private consulting firm for governments and international corporations and the chairman of Silver Road Capital. From 2009 uh, until 2013, he served as Israel's deputy foreign minister and as a member of Knesset. From 2002 until 2006, he served as the ambassador of Israel to the United States. Prior to this, he worked for half a decade uh, in the Israeli Prime Minister's office as the senior foreign policy advisor to Prime Ministers Netanyahu, Barak, and Ariel Sharon. And last but definitely not least, a good friend, a uh, member of the European Parliament, Nicholas Herbst, is, who is a German politician of the Christian Democratic Union, who has been serving as the member of the European Parliament since 2019. From 2017 until 2019, Herbst served as advisor to Minister President Daniel Günther. 
He has since been serving on the Committee on Budgets and the Committee on Fisheries. In addition to his committee assignment, he is part of the Parliament's delegation to the ACP EU Joint Parliamentary Assembly and the European Parliament Intergroup on Seas, Rivers, Islands, and Coastal Areas. And with this, I will turn to you. Bonnie, good evening, and thank you for joining us. Especially in the aftermath of 9 11, the US is known for developing one of the more robust me uh, mechanisms for, for preventing aid diversion. In the Palestinian context in 2017, it was US aid that introduced the anti terror waiver to guard against abuse of US taxpayer funds by Palestinian extremists. How central? Is this procedure in USAID operations and how difficult is its implementation? We know that back in 2007, there was a serious pushback uh, by Palestinian NGOs who rejected any funding conditionality and boycotted the US funding. Were there other such examples around the world? Do you feel USAID operations are in any way handicapped by applying such stringent, stringent limitations as they're often referred to? Olga, thank you so much. It's a great series of questions. Let me start by thanking you, Gerald, and all of our friends at NGO Monitor. Look, I'd be remiss if I didn't share with those of you who may not have heard yet, but President Trump just announced about two hours ago the establishment of full diplomatic relations between Israel and Morocco, the latest country to sign the Abraham Accords. I think I can hear the ululations of the Moroccan Jewish community in Israel all the way over here in Washington, DC, Mazal Tov. We're truly living in a time of miracles. And this is just one of the great miracles brought to all of us during the course of the Trump presidency. Mazal Tov to Israel and to Morocco, as well as to the other courageous countries who joined the Abraham Accords in a drive toward peace. I think, Olga, that it's in the context of the steps toward peace taken by Arab countries, wealthy countries and poor countries, toward normalized and peaceful relations with Israel, the Jewish state, that we should have this conversation. Some in the media very soon will talk about the bold steps that these countries have taken toward peaceful relations with Israel about historic animosities and Arab solidarity and a break in that so-called solidarity, about Arab leaders whose lives are threatened by their own populations because of the decisions that they've made, about governments becoming unstable because of peace with the Jews. But I see it a little differently. This portrayal by the media will be one-sided. Look at it as more and more countries make peace with Israel, it's going to become less and less dangerous to Arab and Muslim leaders to do so. But let's think too about Israel and the courageous steps that Israel is taking toward peace. These are uncertain paths from a security perspective for Israel. And yet, as, some, as Golda Meir famously said, we will have peace with the Arabs when they love their children more than they hate us. But she also said somewhat less famously when she was asked about the key to Israel's military successes, she said, we have no alternative. Finally, she said, pessimism is a luxury that a Jew can never allow himself. So it's on days like today, Olga, that it's easy to be optimistic, not pessimistic. It's easy to see that Golda's philosophy around military victory is accurate. Having no alternative, Israel has for decades sued for peace. And it's only now when Arab leaders recognize how much they love their own children, how much they see in the future for their own children, that we see peace articulated. And this is exciting, hopeful, and I am optimistic that other countries will follow. And let's also call out the truly courageous players here. I think many in this meeting think fondly of Ambassador David Friedman, the US ambassador to, the United, to Israel. Ambassador Friedman came under scathing criticism from the Jewish communities here in the United States and in Israel for his close relationship with President Trump, for his willingness to engage with Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria, 
for his clear-eyed vision on an approach to the Palestinian Authority and his willingness and ability to walk away from Abu Mazen and his acolytes when they spoke ill of American generosity and American willingness to broker peace. Ambassador Friedman is a man of great courage. He took risks for peace. He knew that he is accountable to the president, to the worldwide Jewish community, and maybe to a higher power too. And he pushed and he prodded and he guided world leaders toward peace, toward the recognition that Muslim mothers love their children just as much as Jewish mothers do. So let's talk about the tools that were available to people like Ambassador Friedman as he undertook his role initially in Tel Aviv and in the historic move of the US Embassy to Jerusalem. As you pointed out, after 9-11, the United States received the most unwelcome message that secure borders are a relative thing. This is a reality that Israel has lived with even since before independence. But we in the United States were complacent and comfortable with peaceful allies along our borders. The fragility of peace was shattered by terrorist controlled aircraft and reality in the United States changed that day. We became aware that terrorism is as real a threat to us as it is to every other Western democracy around the world. So we undertook ways to address terrorist threats. And one of those ways was through cutting off access to financing. How do you shut someone down? You cut off their oxygen. Well, what is the oxygen of terror organizations? It's access to financing. After 9-11, the Bush administration put into effect some guardrails to help keep funding away from terrorists and from organizations supporting of terrorism, as well as of individual terrorists themselves. With the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security, we were able to cross-reference names and identities to hone in on terror networks and the financing around them. But just as we fine-tuned our technologies, so too did terror organizations. They became more nimble, more artful, and more dangerous in the cyber world. And now I'll be a little more candid about the years between Bush and Trump, also known as the Obama administration. Just as the bad guys got better at being bad, we got a little more complacent, a little more lazy, back to the way that we felt pre 9-11. We would check databases to make sure that the bad guys, the terrorists didn't get into the United States, but somehow they did. We doubled down on Osama bin Laden, but that's not where it should have ended. There was a lot more to do and we didn't stay as sharp as we could have. Under the Trump administration, the approach to countering terror was sharpened once again, and efforts to cut the oxygen supply, namely financing, were revived. While I served at USAID up until last month, I was, as you said, the senior agency vetting officer. What does that even mean? It meant that every single effort to fund aid grants and contracts in certain countries uh, had to be vetted through our counterterrorism vetting system. And it had to be vetted after that through me. Eyes on. Additionally, because the Palestinian Authority walked away from negotiations, we didn't see many reasons why we had to continue funding assistance activities in Palestinian controlled areas, especially as they weren't being courageous. They weren't partners for peace. Combining enhanced vetting with the reality that there are lots of parts of the world that actually merit US taxpayer dollars for assistance, I allowed most activities associated with the Palestinians to time out. They lapsed. Grants ended and they were not renewed. Some grants were canceled. On top of that, the historic Taylor Force Act enabled our ability and ended our ability to fund activities until the Palestinian Authority dropped its pay for slay program and it kept our funds away from them. 
And finally, in 2018, Congress passed the Anti-Terrorism Clarification Act called ATCA. Abu Mazen and his crew had to withdraw all of their requests for assistance or they would have become liable for terror acts committed on their watch, liable in US courts for terror attacks on US citizens which would have potentially cost them dollars. Now look, there are organizations that are upset that the US took this hard line, European NGOs, et cetera. But I committed to the American people when I testified before Congress for my confirmation and when I swore my oath to uphold and protect the Constitution of the United States, I swore that I would be a good steward of US taxpayer dollars. And during my time at USAID, I viewed the vetting mechanisms that I enforced as a method for doing that. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Nicholas, to you. According to NGO Monitor's research, from 2011 to 2020, the EU alone authorized at least 38 million euros to projects involving terror-linked NGOs. And while there are strict policy requirements in place, we know that, there seems to be a discrepancy between how the EU administration and professionals, European Commission namely, and some, sometimes diplomats, and on the other hand, the elected officials in the European Parliament see this issue. You were one of the MEPs who demanded clarity and action on these issues uh, this year. And consequently, the European Commission is currently in the middle of an internal review. Why do you think the European Commission and some diplomats have a harder time critically discussing EU's engagement with the civil society? Do you think the EU could have handled um, differently the reports that the EU funded NGOs whose senior officials were arrested for Rina Schnurg's murder. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on this very special day. Um, I, I'm, I can't answer this last question because if I, if I would say yes, that would be a very harsh uh, verdict. And um, um, But we are... Uh, we have been doing wrong as a European Union in the, in the last few years. Um, and you gave us some examples. Um, and uh, we should be, as a European Union, we should be uh, obliged to uh, work for the security of Israel. That is uh, our duty. Uh, I'm saying this also as a German politician. Um, so we have to get better. And it, just as you said, the, the commissioner is doing a, a review. And I trust him. Commissioner Vahaley is uh, um, on the right track, I hope. And I hope we will get the results as soon as possible so that we can act. Basically, as you said, our requirements are not that bad. Uh, they say very clearly that uh, any organization, any NGO that uh, employs uh, members linked uh, to terrorist organizations or even has workshop participants or something like that um, uh, as members uh, of terrorist organizations uh, shouldn't get funds should not be uh, getting any money from the European Union. Then we had this political discussion earlier this year, I'm sure you remember, when some officials, and I think you refer to them with your question, um, said, well, this, this applies if someone is on the terror list with his first name and second name, which is, of course, not enough. Uh, we don't need to argue about that. And I hope that the commissioner will get a, a clear result on this uh, as soon as possible. Um, so. To answer your question, why do have some people a hard time saying uh, clear words or uh, working for transparency and clarity? Well, it's basically a big widespread misunderstanding that um, they think they help the Palestinian cause or the Palestinian people, but they don't. This is not only against the security of Israel, this is also uh, against the future of uh, Palestinian people. Uh, this is a crime against Palestinians to, to uh, fund um, terrorist organizations, directly or indirectly, and uh, we have to tackle this problem. Uh, let me also say that I do believe that a civil society needs functioning NGOs, and NGOs are important. And um, the European Union um, has a, uh, a duty to support good uh, and uh, 
NGOs, regardless of their political opinion, it's not uh, that we can choose what is a good NGO and what is a bad NGO, but we have to draw a very clear red line. Funding terrorists indirectly is a red line. As a European Union, we have to tackle this problem. I hope that we are on the right way, but there's still a, quite a road uh, lying before us that we have to go. But I, I think that there's a growing numbers also of members of European Parliament who are aware that we cannot uh, go on like we did in the past. And also, let me also say, because I'm a member of the budget committee, uh, we're also talking about taxpayers' money. Uh, that's true. First of all, security of Israel is much more important, but we also have to uh, talk about taxpayers' money. And let me be very uh, clear on this. Um, we make the rules. If we pay the money, we make the rules. Um, and uh, I think that any NGO who is um, devoted to peaceful um, living, a living together um, uh, will follow our rules and those who are not will have to explain why they don't. We, we make the rules, period. Those are very encouraging words coming from, uh, from the European Parliament. I'm happy to hear that. That is something that I usually, uh, um, I, usually I like to raise in my conversations that we cannot make sure that all NGOs are doing only good but we can be responsible for the ones that we engage with and that we entrust with the public funds. So I'm very, I'm very, very glad to, uh, to hear you basically echo, uh, echo that. Um, Ambassador Ayalon is a little uh, uh, late. He's being held at a TV interview, so we will forgive him, uh, which is why we will go back to Bonnie now with a second question uh, to allow uh, Ambassador Ayalon uh, uh, a few more extra minutes to finish his uh, uh, TV appearance. Um, Bonnie, ensuring that no governmental, fu governmental funds go to terror elements through humanitarian aid should be a bipartisan endeavor in everyone's interest, right? I mean, that, that should be a no-brainer. How does US aid ensure that these requirements, be, be, be it anti-terror or anti-corruption or any other uh, imposed to NGOs, are not politicized internally, both within the USA, but also within the Senate and the US uh, government in general. Um, I ask this as the issue of development aid and NGOs is too often politicized and immediately split into one of the two automatic categories, categories either pro-Israel or pro-Palestinian, regardless of facts. It's a tough one, I know. <laughs> Olga, you're absolutely right. And look, everything having to do with Israel and the Palestinians gets politicized. Uh, agencies, yes, we did. But did I have the law on my side? Yes, I did. The law as uh, put into place by Congress, the Taylor Force Act, No Pay for Slay, ATCA, the Palestinian Authority walked away from all U.S. assistance. But then, of course, there were exceptions. Did I provide humanitarian assistance for COVID for Palestinians? Yes, I did. We provided funding to Palestinian hospitals to care for COVID patients, understanding that the pandemic doesn't know any national or subnational boundaries but we actively vetted the hospitals receiving the assistance so as to ensure that the aid didn't get diverted. Look, I don't view assistance as either pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli. I view assistance that's provided through USAID as pro-American. It's a way to project the generosity of the American people and to promote, to promote our own national security. Niklas just said this so well, it's our money, so we make the rules on how it's used and who it goes to. In Washington, we think the same. No one automatically has a right to US assistance. It has to be deemed as being in our national interest. And that's how I carried out my role in the administration of aid. It's in working with organizations like NGO Monitor that we're able to make sure that our work benefits intended beneficiaries, not terrorists, not terror organizations. 
We're looking at the waning days of the Trump administration. And one of the things, if you've been watching Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, you may have seen him uh, vocalizing, which I think is very important. We have undertaken tremendous efforts in the US government to counter anti-Semitism. But one of the things that Secretary Pompeo has begun to talk about is promoting activities that counter the BDS movement at worldwide, the boycott, divest, and sanction movement that is clearly targeting Israel. And it, it was very encouraging, I think, for all of us in the administration and in the Jewish community to see uh, Secretary Pompeo's recent visit in Samaria and partook of some of the beverages that were on supply there. These are important moves. They're symbolic, yes, but they also indicate the general thrust of the American public. We've come a long way over the course of the last four years in terms of the approach to Israel, as well as the approach to the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One of the things that we've seen that's been so critical has been that the Arab countries who have now made peace with Israel in the last several months have made peace without preconditions. It's not land for peace, as Prime Minister Netanyahu said, it's peace for peace. And so we look at assistance in very much the same way. Is it beneficial to the national security of the United States to be providing assistance? And if so, is assistance in certain areas of the world properly vetted? And if it is uh, both in our interest as well as properly vetted, then we can consider it. Is anything automatic? No, it isn't. And so again, going back to standing with friends and allies, living in these miraculous times of great courage, I would say that uh, we, we are very thankful for partners like you who keep us on the straight and narrow, who send us messages letting us know when things look like they're veering off course, if there is an organization that we maybe should look at twice before funding. I think during my time at USAID, we did a great job of avoiding any accidental funding mistakes, but it's because we took a very deliberate approach to vetting and to making sure that end beneficiaries were the ones who were intended and not terrorists. Thank you, Bonnie, for, for both the kind words to us. We are, this is why uh, NGO Monitor was, was created to uh, raise awareness and share our research with uh, all and any interested uh, stakeholders. And particularly as a former official of the USAID, one of the, uh, the largest aid uh, uh, agencies in the world, this is extremely important. Um, you said that the aid is not given automatically and that is exactly what we often encounter in our conversations, especially with the European uh, representatives of development uh, uh, ministries or agencies or ministries of foreign affairs, it depends in, on a country how the aid is being distributed. And unfortunately, um, sometimes, you know, working with a, with a particular organization um, during a certain period of time, um, well, maybe they, they were okay, even if circumstances change, they find themselves automatically renew, renewing the grant. And then the whole vetting procedure is taken out of an, a context out of timing. So I think that your words resonate very strongly. And if, uh, if, uh, uh, policies similar to the ones that the USAID were, um, you know, taken as best practices and applied uh, uh, elsewhere, we might see, we could see different results. I recently read an article by a Norwegian refugee council, uh, one of their uh, senior employees, and he many times referred to USAID vetting mechanisms as a, as a benchmark. He would say, uh, you know, this organization was vetted by the USAID, and if it was good enough for USAID, then how, why shouldn't it be good enough for us? Um, 
So I think uh, it's almost a, a, a common knowledge that uh, the vetting procedures that you guys have in place are, um, are definitely be, to be used as best practices. Um, Nicholas, to you, the EU is Israel's largest trade partner and its immediate neighbor. At the same time, the image that the EU enjoys in the eyes of the Israeli public is often stained by EU's reaction, or should I say often lack of reaction to issues like the one we are discussing today, EU's you know, uh, unknowing funding of uh, terror elements or projects that uh, uh, incite to violence or uh, whose frontmen incite to violence and so on. What would you say might be the way to address this? This discrepancy in how in the volume and the magnitude of the partnership and the, uh, the relationship between Israel and the EU and the public image that it, that it has uh, uh, here with the, with the citizens? Well, if I had to answer the question the other way around, what uh, I, I always tell my, 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 my friends, don't look at Israel only as, as this, only at this conflict. It's, Israel is so much more. And it's the other way around, it's vice versa, just the same. I mean, we have a growing uh, cooperation when it comes to uh, defense issues and uh, military affairs. We have, um, we even play football together in the, in the European uh, Cup. So uh, um, there's so much more. Um, Israel is a, a role model for us when it comes to startup policy and technologies. So uh, maybe we should not always look at this conflict and see that there's so much more in our relations. But uh, I think that uh, what we really need is a, a permanent reassurance when it comes to uh, the matter we are talking about. Um, we need clarification all the time and reassurance that uh, EU funds are never knowingly spent to EU's uh, NGOs uh, um, benefiting um, uh, terrorism, uh, supporting terrorism. And we have to make this constantly and very clear. I mean, you don't need many rules, but you need clear and strict rules and you need to follow them. Uh, and that basically is the answer to your question. And uh, if we do this, I think uh, we, we will be able to concentrate more on the positive things of our relations uh, much more. But on, on the other hand, you have, please have, you have to bear in mind that the European Union is not a homogeneous body. It's not a state. Uh, there are 27 members with uh, especially when it comes to foreign and uh, security policy, very different approaches. The European Union, um, uh, and it's one of its greatest weakness, has no real competence in this area. So please bear this in mind. Uh, the European Union sometimes um, needs to get better, in, especially in the field of foreign policy. And um, uh, there's still a, a long road ahead for us. Thank you for that. And it's, a, it's an important point that you raised that uh, uh, sometimes in Israel, the, the, the European Union is seen as one homogenic, uh, homogeneous uh, uh, entity, and that is definitely not the case. Even on the topic that we are discussing tonight, uh, we can see this markets in how, uh, um, how different states uh, reacted. The Dutch government froze its funding to one of the organizations whose uh, frontmen were involved uh, with the murder of Rina Schnurb and is investigating. The EU is going into, is in the middle of an investigation, but many other countries are, haven't yet um, uh, picked up the issue. Thank you so much. And we are joined by Ambassador Dani Ayalon. Thank you for being with us. And I will, because we are running short on time and we still wanna hear uh, from you and um, and uh, want you to share your insights with us. I'll go straight to questions. Um, as a former member of the Knesset and former Israeli diplomat, what was your experience in engaging with counterparts in the US and Europe on issues such as terror-linked NGOs uh, who, who incite to or glorify uh, violence? How difficult is it to engage in a constructive discussion on such difficult issues? Can you share an anecdote or a situation with us? Let's see if we can. Okay, but I might. In the meantime, maybe I'll um, I'll uh, address um, a question to you, Nicholas. Um, that I I was I'm about to ask uh, Ambassador Alon uh, as my second question. It, the the uh, this issue in in um, 
looking at the NGOs as a potential pair element or a vehicle of hate, you know, or, or a process of radicalization is not something that the governments um, digest easily and it has taken them a, a long time. What would you say that Israeli uh, elected officials could do more or differently uh, to make your job easier, so to say, so to speak? Um, first of all, we need um, intelligence and we need uh, an oversight. Uh, we need information and uh, that is very important. Um, we need to uh, talk to each other. Uh, well, it's a very simple, it's a very simple answer, but it's a, the, the, I think it's the basic for everything, the basis for everything that we uh, talk with each other and that we try to understand each other's position. And um, because as I said earlier, um, it's a widespread mis misunderstanding uh, among politicians that uh, they, if they want to do something good for the Palestinians, um, they support NGOs without looking and reassuring and without transparency. Uh, I'm not saying that we that we should cut down on, uh, on NGOs generally, not at all. I'm, as I said before, I, I do believe that a strong civil society needs strong uh, NGOs, but we need to take a look at terrorism because terrorism is a threat to everyone uh, and it's a threat to peace. It also That means it's also a threat to the Palestinians. And yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, we should... Um, um, gather intelligence, we should share our, our, our knowledge <clears throat> um, on NGOs, on the process uh, in general, and um, that, that would be the next uh, step that we should have to take. And uh, uh, maybe it's a little naive answer that I, that I gave, but uh, I, I do believe that it's true that we, uh, if we talk about this issue, um, we can solve it. Thank you. And that is actually one of the recommendations that we at NGO Monitor usually make is to, to uh, address these issues, no matter how difficult they might be sometimes in, uh, in uh, inter-parliamentary working groups or dialogues, because this is, the, the, this is the, the platform where where this exchange might take place. Um, I just want to check, do we have Ambassador Ayalon now with us? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, I will. I will. I would actually ask both uh, you, Bonnie and uh, Nicholas. Bonnie can start um, to sort of give us uh, your final five cents on what do you think we can do. And please do take into account both uh, the elected officials or you know members of the administration in your case, or in our case, representatives of the civil society who are in, involved on these issues. What can we do? What should we do? to get this issue moving forward, to raise the bar on how this is addressed in the, pub, in the public and how seriously it is tackled uh, by policymakers. So Olga, I think that this is actually a fairly easy question to answer in the context we're in in the United States as we're transitioning governments. The key is continuity. So I'm talking with people who will be coming in as part of the Biden administration, and I'm sharing with them my views and my experiences as they relate directly to uh, countering terror financing. They, of course, will make their own determinations, but I am confident that they have a solid history of making decisions that'll be based on facts and delivered by intelligence and counterterrorism agencies. We're providing them with that information, with that access, and with that background knowledge. So my fervent hope is that they act based on the facts that they're presented with and not with the compelling emotions that uh, some NGOs or UN agencies may try to present them with. Thank you. And uh, Nicholas, to you. Well, I think basically the most important thing is uh, on its way, we need uh, a review of the standards and criteria for NGOs. And uh, we also need uh, a permanent investigation about how the money is spent. That's something uh, very important in general, but especially in this case. And um, if I had a wish, it would be great if we had some Palestinian NGOs uh, who are engaging with peace on our side as well uh, um, to make a difference. That would be you know, my, my, my wish. Thank you. Then we hope. Let, let's hope all for that. 
um, since the ambassador uh, Ayalon hasn't, I don't know, he's having, I think, technical uh, uh, problems, we have time to actually take some questions from the audience. So uh, let me um, let me start with one. The EU still funds such NGOs as PNGO, uh, affiliated NGOs, even though PNGO refused to sign the anti-terror law. PNGO is a, stands for the Palestinian NGO Network, which is a, an umbrella organization for 150 NGOs. I'm just giving an explanation. Um, and was also a partner of the European Union in drafting Palestinian NGO code of conduct. Um, so the question is, uh, the EU is still funding NGOs such as PNGO, uh, even though PNGO refused to sign the anti-terrorist law. I might add to that that according to media reports, at least eight Palestinian NGOs uh, this year refused to sign contracts with the EU over this infamous uh, anti-terror laws that was introduced, as you know, Nicholas, everywhere in the world by the EU, not, it wasn't a specific uh, uh, requirement uh, in uh, for Palestinian NGOs. So I guess it's, it's uh, the question is to you. Well, that's, that's why I said we make the rules. And uh, if you want to have grants, you have to follow this, this rules. It's, I mean, for me as a lawmaker in the budget committee and the budget control committee, that's pretty, pretty clear. And as you know, with the Badil organization, we have the first example where the money was cut. And um, so it is possible. And uh, I, I guess this is part of the, uh, you know, let's call it negotiations uh, going on. Maybe they try uh, to test how, uh, you know how, how strict the EU is on this matter. Um, I, I think this is a red line that should not be crossed. This uh, anti-terrorist uh, restrictive list is important, and we will we'll have to follow it. Otherwise, you know, it's uh, it's our rule. And uh, so, and uh, as as I said, we have the first example where the non-signing had consequences. Uh, that's the way to go. And if I can follow up on that question, this one is for me, <laughs> not from the audience. Um, what, what, how can you, um, what would you tell us would be the best way procedure wise, because the European Parliament is a very complicated political <laughs> structure. And um, to get one of the EU bodies to change a policy is an extremely complicated uh, endeavor. What would you say would be the, 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 the next uh, logical move to, to sort of forward this process of uh, not only vetting, but once the, the evidence is in place, right, um, and it's all based on, on open source information, so it's easily uh, accessed to, to get uh, actually the EU to implement the existing policies. What would you say as a member of the Parliament and European Parliament as a member of an important committee? Well, first of all, I think we have to wait now for the uh, review by uh, the Commission. The Commission is the uh, uh, decisive uh, body right now. It's not up to the Parliament to um, uh, right now, but uh, we will have to watch it and we will, we will have our resolutions. But to be honest, I couldn't tell you if we had a, um, a vote right now on this issue, what the outcome would be in the Parliament, because it's Across party lines, it's a very difficult situation, especially among the left. There is still this widespread misunderstanding that, you know, uh, being as generous as possible would, would help the, the peace process, which I clearly think is wrong. Um, so, uh, as I said, it's still a long road to go. The next big step is uh, the review by the uh, Commission. The Commission has the power and the, uh, the manpower, especially, um, to tackle this problem. And I hope we will get uh, we will get uh, step by step in the right direction right now. But you know, there's also responsibility by the Parliament. Uh, I understood this, and uh, and uh, especially when it comes to budget control, we also have the means and uh, and uh, um, the possibility to check everything and uh, to you know put the finger to the wound. I don't know, say that in English or it's a. German saying, and um, yeah, we will we will do this. Um, perfect, thank you. Uh, that's very important. And again, uh, you were so vocal on this issue uh, throughout uh, the year, immediately after the the scandal erupted. So, uh, uh, so that that's really uh, reassuring to know that there are uh, such voices. 
um, in the European Parliament. And we have uh, only a few minutes left, so I will uh, read out the la one last question from the audience. Um, and I, I think, uh, Nicholas, I fear it's again to you. <laughs> uh, why do so many, hold on, I lost it on my screen, just a second. Here we go. Why do so many EU members, uh, I guess member states, also fund NGOs directly besides what the EU already done? It's a tricky one. Uh, and maybe for the rest of the audience, uh, EU is the single largest donor, uh, but each EU member state, or at least the more uh, uh, fortunate ones, uh, also have uh, generous uh, aid packages. So that's just a little bit of background to the question. Well, again, I have to admit that the European Union is, is not, uh, uh, it's, it's still under construct uh, construction. Uh, the European Union is very powerful when it comes to means of the uh, internal market or consumer protection, uh, things like that, uh, fishery policy. Uh, we are not good at, at um, that's uh, even though we are called a union, uh, we are not good at uh, foreign policy and the um, uh, foreign policy is mainly done by the member states themselves. And um, you have to understand this. We are not really a big player when it comes to foreign policy. And uh, we also have unanimous decisions in the field of port, uh, foreign policy and the, and the European Council, which doesn't make it much easier. And that is one of the reasons why we are not a big player in foreign policy. You have to understand this. I mean, European Union looks like a homogeneous body and we are not. We are still under construction. And uh, I do believe that we have to get better in this field and in that we need to change our uh, treaties. Uh, uh, but there's uh, um, uh, a lot of work to do still. Thank you so much. And uh, with this, we have uh, exhausted all our time, although I could uh, continue doing this <laughs> for much, much longer. And I hope that uh, sometime sooner rather than later, we will have a chance to meet in person um, and continue this or uh, some happier uh, topic <laughs> of discussion. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, for taking the time. This was an incredible discussion. I think uh, and I believe our audience has learned a lot, uh, like I have. Um, and with this, I would like to make a very short introduction to our next panelist panel that will be uh, moderated by my dear colleague, Anne Hertzberg, who is the legal advisor of NGO Monitor and also our person uh, directing and managing all our activities at the UN. For those of you who might know, NGO Monitor is a UN ECOSOC accredited organization, which means that we have a special uh, special entrance uh, to present uh, at the UN, uh, file submissions, host events, and so on. And all these activities are run by Anne. Anne will introduce uh, her panelists, our dear friends. Um, and please do allow for some 20 seconds for the panel to be set up, as I have to unplug my mic and uh, microphone and Anna has to plug in hers. Thank you again and good evening to everyone. Good evening and Hanukkah Sameach. Thank you, Olga, for the great panel we just listened to. And uh, thank you for joining us for our second panel of the evening. And to our audience who's listening from around the world, so this is very exciting. 
Um, we have a great panel tonight. I just want to announce one change. Um, Nisana Leitner unfortunately got called away on a last minute and very important case in the United States. So she will not be with us tonight, but we have another exciting guest who will appear as our third panelist. And so I will introduce her in due course. Um, in our last panel, we heard from policymakers from the US and the EU and how they've approached the, era, the issue of regulating terrorism and the various considerations that come into play when they make funding decisions. And we also heard very powerful remarks from Rabbi Eitan Schnerb. And his story reminds us all of why we at NGO Monitor feel so passionately about what we are doing and why we are so committed to the issue of, of keeping terrorism and NGO funding in the public debate. NGO Monitor began closely examining the issue of government funding to terror-linked NGOs back in 2007, when we first became aware of the terror background of a very prominent member of, Pal of a Palestinian NGO that had also gotten millions of dollars from the EU and other European governments. And we saw that this group was also a leader in BDS campaigns and lawfare campaigns. And from that first example, we, have, we systematically mapped the Palestinian NGO network and discovered that a large proportion of the group most involved in targeting Israel at the International Criminal Court and applying for arrest warrants of Israeli officials abroad and spearheading major BDS campaigns all had significant ties to the PFLP or were even groups established by the terror organization itself. And over the years, we've issued dozens of reports and have had countless meetings with officials from many countries sharing our research and providing the details that have led to investigations, funding cuts, and changes in funding policies. Our research has also been used by many organizations dealing with similar issues. So in our panel now, we'd like to highlight the work of three notable practitioners who are also leaders in the fight against terrorism, incitement, and anti-Semitism, and all of whom we've had the pleasure to work with. They operate in three very different and difficult contexts in the local, multilateral, and international arenas. I will introduce each speaker in turn and ask them to give a short introduction about their work. And then after we've heard from all three, I will pose some questions to the panelists. And in addition, if anyone in our audience has questions, please type them into the Q&A panel. And we will try to get in as many questions as we can before the end. So first of all, we have Angel Mas, who is the president of ACOM which is the main pro-Israel advocacy group in Spain. With a group of activists over the last 10 years, he has created a highly influential political action team that has become instrumental in the fight against anti-Semitism and the defense of Israel's political interests in a relatively hostile environment. In addition to its public diplomacy political work, ACOM is the reference voice of the pro-Israel Spanish civil society in traditional and social media. And so I'd like to turn the floor over to Angel. And please excuse my voice. I have a bit of a cold, so my voice is a little bit unsteady tonight. So apologies. Thank you, Anne. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, first of all, thank you to NGO Monitor, not just for allowing us to participate here, but frankly, for all this partnership through, throughout uh, uh, the past years. Uh, I think the partnership that uh, Gerald and uh, Olga have mentioned uh, Clearly, in our case, has been uh, has been a privilege. Um, in terms of um, ACOM, ACOM, as we say in Spanish, uh, it was founded uh, uh, 16, 17 years ago by a group of uh, Spanish people that wanted the voice of uh, Spanish people with the Spanish accent to be heard in favor of Israel, in favor of the betterment of uh, the relationship between our two countries. Our diplomatic relationships are very young. The, we established diplomatic relationships in 86. Spain established diplomatic relationships with Israel after it did, uh, Israel did with uh, Egypt. So they are very mature and that's noticeable. Also our Jewish uh, communities reestablished themselves in Spain not so long ago and they're relatively small and relatively not very visual, not very um, noticeable. So um, the voice in favor of Israel was uh, necessary. Um, what started as a political group, as a, a political lobby, 
and uh, continues being a political lobby that uh, aspires to be as bipartisan as possible. Uh, moved, as you mentioned, also into uh, social media and traditional media because that field was really a monologue uh, at the time, uh, a very anti-monologue at the time. And unfortunately, and I have to say, unfortunately, around 2015, we were forced to move into a new field that probably has been, to some extent, our claim to fame internationally, which was um, uh, lawfare. Uh, unfortunately, with the, with the accession of uh, Podemos, a, a very hostile political party to power in uh, local uh, uh, municipalities, regional governments, they started promoting the BDS from the institutions and uh, we were forced to, um, to look for the protection of uh, what our constitutional democracy offers to a minority like the US minority, which is the rule of law and the protection of the courts. So far we have won 76 cases against discrimination for uh, against Israeli nationals, Israeli companies, but any Spanish national that would support openly and uh, and uh, uh, be associated with the state of Israel, we have lost none. Um, it's been a, it's been a struggle, but uh, again with the support of uh, organizations such as NGO Monitor, um, I think uh, at least we put a, a bit of a of a stop to that uh, harassment that we have been suffering. Thank you, Angel, that's amazing, 76 cases. So um, in our discussion today, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, so we'll turn to our second speaker, Daniel Schwamenthal, who is the director of the AJC Transatlantic Institute and the secretary general of the Transatlantic Friends of Israel group. Before joining the Transatlantic Institute, Daniel worked for seven years as an editorial page writer and op-ed editor at the Wall Street Journal Europe, writing about EU politics and economics, the Arab-Israeli conflict, Iran, radical Islam, and terrorism. Prior to that, Daniel worked for six years as a reporter for Dow Jones Newswires in Bonn, Berlin, and Brussels, covering German and European politics, economics, and regulatory affairs. So Daniel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, and um, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I direct the EU Brussels office of the American Jewish Committee. We have, uh, which is quite unusual for an American Jewish organization, we have uh, quite a number of foreign offices, particularly in Europe, um, in total seven offices of representations. And we work on a number of, of issues. Unfortunately, we can't focus all of our work on uh, fighting terrorism and, and radicalization uh, and incitement. Um, we work a lot on fostering transatlantic relationships. We work a lot on fostering uh, the EU-Israel relationship, anti-Semitism, fighting anti-Semitism. And of course, in that context, uh, uh, the fight against um, incitement, violent extremism and terrorism. And uh, we as an organization, AJC, I think we have definitely been at the forefront uh, warning member states and governments um, about the rise of parallel societies, the rise of uh, and rising influence of um, radical Islamists in Europe, um, which is often uh, also connected with, with um, anti-Semitism. And uh, to this day, I think one of the, the most critical issues that we are trying to convey is that the fight of, against terrorism doesn't start and end with police and intelligence work. It has to start much earlier. It's a, qu a question about confronting the ideology. And um, this, to this day, it remains a very difficult issue. Uh, still, we see and I'm sure we're going to get into this in more detail, uh, how now President Macron is being uh, attacked, actually much more now in the US and perhaps around Europe for supposedly um, anti-Muslim uh, Isla uh, Islamophobia, 
uh, when in fact uh, he's now presenting a law that has been negotiated also with moderate Muslim organizations that is not targeting Muslims, it's targeting uh, radicalization. So this, this remains to this day um, one of the trickiest issues and one of the most important issues where we are trying to um, add our voice and uh, uh, add content and value. And, and you, you discussed earlier how the EU is uh, supporting NGOs in, in the Palestinian territories uh, that actually contradict the EU's own foreign policy or stated foreign policy of promoting peace and uh, reconciliation. And we know more and more of finding out that it's actually often doing this even within the EU itself, that the EU and certain member states are funding uh, NGOs that uh, claim to a represent Muslim communities, which is often simply not true, but also claim to be moderate. And, 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 and it's not, not true just, uh, just last week, I think France um, banned the uh, an organization called the Collective Against Islamophobia in France. Among other, uh, uh, among the reasons is that uh, the that it had very close connections to uh, jihadists who were fighting in Syria with Al Qaeda, and that same organization has received generous funding from the European Commission. So we already see that the the the, the problem is actually much deeper. Um, it's uh, of course Israel is the is a very um, focused victim of this misallocation of resources, to put it mildly. But it is not the only victim. It, it, it's it's so non-transparent the decision-making process, and not just at the EU but also at, at, at member state level. What are the criteria? Why? Uh, how how these decisions are made? And it's usually more at the mid-management level. Um, that these decisions are made, and it's 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 often very bizarre, and um, and and we are we are hurting our, our own interests, um, and in not just in a faraway uh, conflict, but here in Europe ourselves, when when uh, when we support financially support and thus empower the very organizations that are actually uh, part of the problem and not part of the solution. So that that sort of as an introductory uh, short statement, the, the main work that we are that, that we are doing in this respect. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and I do want to get back to the issue of France. So after we hear from our next speaker, uh, we'll definitely turn back to that. Um, so our last speaker is Miriam Rosenstein, who is the executive director of the German organization NAFO, the Middle East Peace Forum. Previously, she was senior manager of governmental affairs at AstraZeneca, the international pharmaceutical company. And after working for many years in various management consultancies as an expert in public affairs, Ms. Rosenstein studied economics and sociology at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And I want to give her a big uh, shout out because she's actually just landed, I believe in Zurich. And, um, so she's speaking from the airport. So we are, are grateful she was able to join us today. So thank you and, and welcome, Miriam. Yes, uh, well, thanks to everyone and uh, hello. I'm really sorry, I just, literally just got out of the plane. So I'm still kind of standing in a hopefully quiet spot at the uh, airport. Um, and it was also a bit on a short notice that I popped in this panel. Um, but I tried uh, my best to uh, contribute as much as I can. Um, yeah, so I'm executive director of NAFO. NAFO is a German organization and it's called now Ostfriedensforum, which literally translates into Middle East Peace Forum. Um, I've been with NAFO quite a while, um, but as executive director only about uh, two, two years, let's say that. Um, we work in Germany, try to uh, create more awareness for the region within the German politics. As you all know, um, Germany is like more or less the biggest player in the EU. Um, and we look uh, as uh, when we look uh, if we look into the uh, international organization, often Germany is also the biggest um, individual payer 
um, to the uh, organizations that, is, that are supported by the EU. So therefore, from um, the point we're looking at now, Germany is an important player, but also if we look at uh, general politics in the Middle East and on Europe's stake, Germany is often has often a key role. But, and here comes the big but, Germany often does not really take this leadership role because for historic reasons, for other uh, reasons, because sometimes simply they don't dare and or they think like we cannot actually uh, kind of um, well, lead the way of uh, how Europeans are doing it. So there is a gap in um, what actually Germany, what role it plays and how they kind of see themselves. And, and that's one of the reasons why, especially when it comes to the terms of financing, we see um, there is a need for uh, learning for the government. What I can say from various talks that we do have with the German government, sometimes or with German politics in general, also sometimes they do fund projects, they do fund organizations which they don't really know who they are, and then they set outlines for the projects and the criteria for the projects themselves are perfectly met. I give you an example. We. We're looking at the school buildings that are financed um, by German government money uh, in the Palestinian territories. These school buildings are built according to the criteria that um, the German government set up, according to everything which was required by them. And now comes the big but. The building itself is not the problem. The problem is what is hanged up inside the classrooms, what are the classes' names, etc. And these are the things that are not inside the catalog of criteria you have while funding these projects. So this means even if you have kind of perfect funding, the perfect setup, often people with their kind of ideological agenda do misuse this project on more on a moral way than on an actual financial way. And that's tremendously difficult to track. We've uh, tried to address that within members of, of, of parliament in Germany and also with the government, but it's so difficult to find a setting to actually follow up on that. And I think that's one of the, the key challenges that we will have to look at in, in the near future how to stop this misuse of totally correct financed project and how to ensure that the, I'd say like the moral um, meaning of, of this project is according to what the, um, those who give the funds actually implied by building such a thing or by, by providing these funds. It, very interesting. Um, one, one thing you mentioned, Miriam, that I just want to touch on, and then we'll get back to speaking about the EU more generally, and the Spanish context is, is um, it is something that kind of frustrates Israelis is that we see, you know, the German government's very supportive of Israel, like militarily, um, in terms of, you know, Holocaust restitution, dealing with the historical past, um, economics. Um, but it is a little frustrating sometimes that why why do you think that Germany doesn't take that leadership role in the EU because and and sort of speak out against these things that we as Israelis see that you know we see them as discriminatory towards Israel or unfair. Oh. Um, so so why do you think the German government is unwilling to sort of step up or or do you know what's motivating motivating that? Um, it's not actually a lack of a specific motivation. It's more um, often when it comes to international organizations, like, for example, um, the voting uh, of Germany in the UN. Mm -hmm. um, here you see that Germany really kind of sticks to this European concept. They ever say like, oh, we cannot vote against our European friends or uh, we do vote within the consent. And then to be honest, I think sometimes it's just that they um, they say like, okay, in other worlds that are more important to us, we need our European friends on our side, and then it's a bargain. 
Interesting. Um, and so maybe I'll turn to you, Daniel, also, if you, if you could sort of lay out what you see as the dynamics that are going on within Europe, maybe the different fault lines and how that impacts your work and dealing with um, you know, ad Israeli advocacy issues and dealing with terrorism, anti-Semitism. Right. Uh, well, we have here, when it comes to, to, to Israel uh, advocacy, uh, Germany is, of course, within the EU context, um, uh, definitely a, a very positive factor. And I, th and I think what to, to, to complete what, what Miriam is saying is it's also very often that these issues take time to trickle down from maybe a very, um, very positive uh, attitude from a foreign minister to trickle down to the nitty gritty bureaucracy and uh, diplomatic uh, uh, lower middle management level uh, than in Brussels or, or in New York and, and, and these institutions where this is often then drafted and decided uh, sometimes certainly not not these big UN votes, but 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 other decisions often not even uh, with any input necessarily from from foreign ministers. Um, so coming back to um, to the you know the terrorism and 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 radicalization um, uh, issue. Uh, what uh, what what we have learned over um, over the time is is that it's you know first of all it's very important to to uh, to shine the light on, on things and, and and very often this is this is part of the work and, and the most important part of the work to to even make certain things an issue at all for example my colleagues in Berlin um, are right now very active on the Islamic Center in Hamburg which is a Tehran controlled and funded Islamic center that is being observed by the German equivalent of the FBI uh, or, 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 or Shin Bet. Um, and even though it's observed, it, it's allowed to operate uh, and it is considered to be really the, the, the most important um, center like this in, in uh, Iranian outpost uh, in Europe. Uh, one of the former chairs later became the president of Iran. Uh, the pr president of Iran uh, actually appoints uh, or, or certainly has to confirm uh, the chair of the center. They, they held a, uh, um, a, a vigil for uh, um, Suleiman Kassam. They, 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 you know, uh, distribute, um, uh, um, you know, radical material anti-Semitism, they were involved and have been involved in these Al-Quds marches. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite absurd that this, is, that this is possible, that in, in one of the biggest cities in Germany, uh, Germany, a close friend of Israel, allows Iran to have such a footprint, so, to have so much influence, but it's not even an issue. So, so the groundwork is being done by, by my colleagues in Berlin to really put this really on, on the radar screen. They put out a, a brochure collecting information about it. And now it is slowly being, being discussed in, um, um, in, in the media. And, 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 and hopefully we will see some action, particularly after Germany made that really historic decision to ban unilaterally Hezbollah in its entirety uh, through, um, throughout Germany. Um, my, my colleagues in France, again, are, are, are quite quite involved uh, uh, in, in, in a consulting uh, role in, 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 in the legislation that is now being uh, un, uh, unveiled in, in, in France on fighting uh, uh, radicalism and bringing up ideas, um, particularly the issue, which is not yet completely incorporated in the French thinking on this issue, namely the role that uh, anti-Semitism plays for uh, uh, radical Islam, the, the central role as an ideology and as a recruitment. Um, again, this is the most important role that we have to really inform and shine the light on, on, on certain issues um, that get otherwise not, um, um, not, not even attention. We here in, in, in Brussels have been, uh, that was one of my personal pet, pee pet peeves, is uh, to put an end to foreign funding of um, um, particularly radical foreign funding for mosques and, and, and Muslim schools 
um, uh, in Europe, which, which um, in, in, in most cases uh, comes in still unhindered. Um, and it is virtually impossible uh, simply for the police to, uh, to, 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 to investigate or to even observe. I mean, all these different mosques and, and schools, and we don't really know what is, what is going on, but we must assume that if uh, a mosque is funded, say, by Qatar, that they don't do this in order to necessarily uh, preach brotherly love and um, and uh, uh, world peace. So, uh, in 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 my view, it's it's one of the most important issues is that we as free societies here in Europe cannot allow that unfree societies come in and uh, and influence our school systems, our education system, our religious education. This is as we have seen and uh, as a result of these terror attacks, this is a national security issue. So we were quite uh, instrumental in getting this idea that we should really put an end to foreign funding when it comes from non-democratic countries um, into a, a European Parliament uh, resolution that was passed uh, two years ago. So, so again, these are constantly issues where where we have to shine a light raise it bring it bring it even to the attention um, of the policymakers and that's that's mo that, that's the most difficult work and then once you present these arguments that are actually usually very compelling um, then 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 things can actually happen you're muted thanks um, uh, oh yeah, okay. Angel, I, I, I want to turn to you. Um, in, the, in the Spanish context, one thing we've noticed in our research is that the Spanish government is probably top five, maybe even at the top of the main funder of uh, PFLP linked NGOs, not just the uh, central government, but the local government. And so I guess I'm wondering, could you do sort of lay out the Sort of the political scene in Spain and, and why you think that is and is it basically because there's very far left governments in power or what do you think's driving that and 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 what do you what have you done specifically to to try to uh, counter that? Well, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, I was listening to to the fact that uh, Germany claims that they don't want uh, protagonism, and Spain says the same. Basically, everybody's washing their hands. And, uh, and avoiding the very serious accountability that comes with uh, being a, a significant donor to either uh, the Palestinian Authority, to uh, Palestinian NGOs, or even, and I want to add this uh, to the list, to political actors in Israel. We as Spaniards, we object, as Spanish citizens, we object to the fact that Spain would fund uh, so-called NGOs in the fringe of the political sphere in Israel that are in fact political actors. We cannot imagine what the reaction in Spain would be if the Israeli government was funding separatist movements in Spain, for instance. It's a very, very serious responsibility. So Spain is used to a very uh, asymmetrical relationship with Israel is used to being able to kick Israel in the shin all the time and expect that there's no consequences to that. Uh, we have seen that throughout our democracy. We have seen that with uh, right-wing parties, but mostly with left-wing parties. And uh, so we have seen, and with the work uh, jointly with NGO Monitor, how different, uh, Spain has a highly devolved political system to the regions and how you know municipalities, so local governments, provincial governments, regional governments, and the national government, regardless of the color, but typically more often to the left, have been funding projects to NGOs that otherwise would not be admissible, eligible for funding. It, it, it just takes a few minutes going through their web pages to understand that they promote hatred, that they are not for, uh, for uh, peace, even though in their name there's always peace somewhere in the in the name, but they're not for they're not for peace, they're not for coexistence, they're not for two-state solutions. So it would have been a very uh, but they have created this industry in Spain. 
this is an industry, an industry that fits itself with the, um, uh, the, the, the friendship between some government officials, typically sometimes not very high ranking, as, as, as uh, it was mentioned before, middle ranking, but that year after year, they will ensure that this subsidy, this grant comes to these people and the grants that, that are granted at the regional, local level are very, very difficult to screen, very difficult to follow, very difficult to audit. Uh, when you combine that, so the public funding of these uh, hundreds of NGOs with the fact that that funding is used in the local authorities, in the, state, uh, in the, in the institutions of the state, for the state itself to discriminate Israelis and Jews, pro-Israel Jews in Spain. And when you have that uh, blessed from the national government, where the vice president of that government was until the day before he was sworn in, hosting two shows in Hispan TV, Spanish speaking, Iranian national broadcasting system, two programs were the most blatant, the most um, uh, aggressive anti-Semitic slogans of world Jewish domination were, uh, were, were broadcasted. Well, you have a situation in Spain that I would say is complicated. Um, of course, Spain nominally will want to be in the mainstream of, mainstream of Europe, so nominally will follow EU decisions, even though Germany relinquishes its uh, responsibility and Spain as the fourth largest economy in Europe, apparently as well. So you start looking around and you go, whose responsibility is that? If it's not Germany's, if it's not Spain's, and I'm sure the French will say the same, then whose responsibility is this? But if we say, no, we want to be mainstream Europe, so we want to adopt IRA, as a definition. Well, with that comes responsibilities. If IRA says that the demonization, the dehumanization, the criminalization permanently of Israel, of the only Jewish state, is a sign of anti-Semitism, that, that uh, sick obsession, then the Spanish government is funding anti-Semitism. And again, there's a responsibility. Our goal is first politically to highlight that, but second, if that is not, um, you know, if, if we don't get any traction there, we will need to use what we still believe in, which is our constitutional democracy and the rule of law. So we will go to the courts as we have been doing, and we will hopefully be winning those cases. Mm -hmm. Miriam, did you want to add something on, on this issue? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, actually, I can only uh, agree to, to, to both of you. Um, I think there are different levels. One is the, the level of the funding of uh, international organization outside the country. Um, there we have this uh, gap between actually taking responsibility and uh, being or, or kind of saying, yeah, we wrote, we wrote in the European concepts. Then there also we have the problem of uh, understanding what they're actually funding. On the other level, we do have the funding of um, kind of internal or local uh, groups like Daniel mentioned, for example, uh, in Germany, uh, the radical um, Islamist Iran in a mosque in Hamburg. Um, but also another example would be a German government allowing so-called DTIP, the Turkish uh, Association of um, uh, pre or pre pre prayers, I don't know how you translate it, um, that they are actually, um, that Turkey is uh, giving the, the content of what has, be, has been taught at the Turkish mosques inside Germany. Um, and those are often also funded by the German government or at least supported. So this kind of internal or local funding is even worse because there, um, you have anti-democratic tendencies and also tendencies that are the opposite of the values of, of, the, uh, of our countries 
that are supported by our governments. And this can't just be because in the end, they undermine or they, they dis destroy um, our societies from inside. And often they're like based on, uh, or they are full of anti-Semitism. They are full of, of hatred against Israel. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, we all know what they're aiming for. With these, we have the problem that um, often these uh, societies or mosques or whatever form of organization it is, they fight or they argue with the freedom of religion. Together with the uh, issue that the German government often doesn't really know what they are doing. Um, for in the example, Daniel, you mentioned in Hamburg, the leading members of parliament did not know what's going on there. They did not know about um, this society. They simply had no clue what they are about. And it took us and other uh, organization, HAC was very much involved. Also, VET Initiative was involved. We were not, everyone was involved to actually, well, open their eyes. It was a very similar case with Hezbollah. It took us, we, we started a campaign on Hezbollah in 2017, starting to explain the German government that Hezbollah is not only an organization in Lebanon, but also an active organization in Europe, in Germany, and that they have their a tremendous network um, of financing what's going on in, in Lebanon and um, financing in the end the missiles uh, directed against Israel. So here we have a problem of lack of knowledge, lack of interest also, and often kind of, at least in Germany, a fear of interfering uh, with freedom of religious of Muslim organization. One question they I have, just, oh yeah, go ahead. They, they just fear um, what's going to happen on the streets of Berlin and other German cities. Too often we have seen burning Israeli flags. We've seen very um, violent groups of people moving through the cities and the, the police actually doesn't really go into it anymore. Now they kind of changed a bit their strategy and they try to stop it from the very beginning. But still, this is a problem of number of people because there are many and it's a, it's a problem of uh, having the intelligence and then it's a, a resource problem the police just doesn't have so many people to actually observe them and to go after them we see that um, since uh, the beginning of this year Hezbollah is actually prohibited in Germany as an organization but also by criminal law not a lot happens because they lack the resources to go after them, to chase them, to uh, follow, to observe their, all their activities. Uh, so here it's, uh, we face huge problems. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing also um, that we, I guess, feel in Israel, and I'll turn to Daniel on this, but I think it's also true if each, each of the speakers can maybe touch on this, is especially, um, we noticed this in France, you, and you were talking earlier, Daniel, about Macron, and um, in the last spate of attacks, you know, he felt very, um, you know, why am I being attacked? He was very defensive, but, you know, he's quite willing to levy uh, condemnations and criticisms when, Israeli take, when Israel takes counter-terror measures. Um, and, that, and, you know, that's something we feel uniquely, you know, whenever there's an attack, Belgium, you know, uh, other places, um, we, you know, the world comes together and we have signs, you know, just we Charlie have dough and everything. Um, and, and we don't see that same sort of support, you know, Palestinian terrorism is kind of put in the separate category um, where it's not really taken as seriously as some of these other um, Islamist movements. And so I was kind of wondering, you know, in your work, how, how do you approach that issue? Is there any hope for changing those attitudes? in Europe and, and after you know you speak to it, I'd like to hear what, what the other speakers have to say about that as well. Right, it's, it's quite uh, uh, ironic if you, if you look at, particularly the United States and the New York Times, the coverage of Macron, he's basically getting the Israel treatment. Uh, it's completely biased, it's lack, it's, 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 it, 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 it's 
uninformed, misinformed. It's it's uh, it's partly libelous, and uh, and as you said. I am also waiting for this aha moment for Macron and others and saying, well, if this is happening to me, maybe maybe not everything I'm reading about Israel is necessarily correct. If they can get, you know, our situation so wrong, uh, maybe the media and the Quai d'Orsay is getting also Israel wrong. I, I, I hope, I, I do believe that there is going to be a connection. Um, to be fair, I think things have improved. If you look in at the early days of the first intifada, uh, when Israel uh, uh, started uh, targeted killings, they were uh, all the time they were you know condemned as extrajudicial assassinations, until of course the West started to do to do the same, um, and, and now when 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 this happens, you don't hear uh, these kinds of condemnations um, uh, uh, anymore. I think, um, at least at the official level, uh, certainly they will condemn and do condemn uh, terrorism. And I think many many uh, we, uh, Israel has many friends. Also, we shouldn't paint uh, such a dark uh, dark picture. There is certainly also that element among certain policymakers and and uh, um, civil servants that, that may in their head put Palestinian terrorism in a different category, that they do see it maybe as unfortunate, but maybe slightly understandable resistance and or, or certainly see Israel uh, partly at least responsible, etc. That, that element is there. But then again, you will also read about, well, you know, did Charlie have to really have to publish these, uh, uh, these cartoons? And how far should we go with freedom of speech? So, um, uh, you know, the, ultimately, you see very similar elements also here. And at the beginning, if you look back, Unfortunately, I'm certainly old enough to remember uh, the 9-11 attacks, you know, why do they hate us, right? This was sort of the big question uh, in America. So we Americans did something wrong. If they fly planes into our skyscrapers, clearly we must be at fault. So you, you, you have that sort of tendency to um, excuse or apologize or, or, or explain terrorism, certainly when it comes from so-called third world countries directed at the West, you have the sort of party, I would say self-hating Western element uh, or overcritical Western um, element. And, and, and it, so it's, it's not com unique to Israel, but it's applied in much higher doses, dosages against uh, uh, against Israel, but I but I do believe you know again uh, it is often also as as Miriam said a question of ignorance, and uh, and here are the good news that you know if you do come with information and 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 credible credible information you can change people's um, uh, uh, hearts, and also the other. Um, the other brief observation I want to make is uh, that uh, I, I do believe, it, it, critically, again, if we look at Israel, that Israel has many, many more friends than we think we have. Um, it is just that uh, Israel's antagonists in Europe are much, much louder uh, and much more motivated. So if we go you know, it's like a typical far left uh, anti-Israeli uh, agitator. It's, it's, uh, uh, he or she will look at the Israeli-Palestinian issue as one of his or her main issues. If you look at a far left parliamentarian, it's, it's a main issue. Now, most parliamentarians voted into European parliaments uh, are not, uh, have not been elected to adjudicate the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. They have been uh, elected to um, uh, to work for their constituency. So, so most people of either goodwill or who are maybe more or less neutral uh, wouldn't even think about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict and don't consider it an important issue. And rightly so, it's not an important issue for the uh, average European policymaker. So, um, so very often 
we actually don't realize that we have many more friends than we do, but we have to sort of activate them a little bit more. We have to, because they rightly say, this is not my issue. I, you know, I, I support Israel, but I'm here to do fisheries or whatever it may be. And, and, and that's, that's the main difference between, um, between the two points. So it's often a question of really um, um, uh, empowering or motivating or encouraging the friends that we already have to actually get active on an issue that is not really the reason why they went into politics. Uh, Angel, what, what's your uh, take on this issue? Uh, we do, we do a lot. We do have a lot of friends, and I agree with the with the assessment that the problem is that the friends we have are much less assertive than the enemies we have. Uh, over here, look, Spain has a very painful history with uh, terrorism, both uh, nationalist terrorism in the form of ETA as well as uh, jihadi terrorism, both in in Madrid in the trains and in Barcelona. And, uh, you know, that connection that uh, this average Spaniard didn't make at the beginning of, look, this looks horribly similar. The methods, the ways, the claims, they look so similar to what is happening in Israel. They didn't make the connection. The media didn't help them make that connection. Um, the reality is that as a result of that, it, we, we see very painful situations here in Spain. For instance, you were mentioning in the, in the previous uh, discussion, the PFLP. We have situations where the mayor of Barcelona, right after the attacks, the jihadi attacks in Barcelona, invited Laila Khaled to just tour the place like if she was some form of heroin. Uh, it's very painful. And we highlighted that to the national police, that she was, her own recognition, a member of the Bureau of the BFLP. And we went to the list of the Spanish police of, of terrorist organizations. And we said, you say that this is a terrorist organization. And by her own admission, she's a member of the Bureau. So why is she not stopped in the border? Why is she allowed to go around? I think this is this is part of the definitely definite double standards we are suffering now. What can we learn from our own experience fighting terrorism in Spain? I think something very important that is what you guys in NGO Monitor and us working together with you are trying to do. The fight against terrorism in Spain, the police the police fight was won. It was not that difficult to win. What was difficult was the industry that had been created, the civil plot, say, around the terrorist plot. And that plot had been sustained, again, by public money, by their own state that was the victim of that terrorism. They were sending money to these you know, groups, groups that masked themselves and their means and their, and their ends under nice names, but they were the industry of what it was called in Spanish liberados, people that were freed from working to do this groundwork of incitement, of information. Uh, what we learned under the Asnar administration here was that going after those people, first with a, with a new form of legal form called apology of terrorism. Not just the one that shoots is not just, not only him is a terrorist, a terrorist. The guy that supports them, provides infrastructure, information, or simply, you know, forgives very publicly what they do is a terrorist. And the second thing is as a result of that, cut off the funding for these people. That was when ETA started finishing that day. That day that the law was changed, it was very criticized because again, it, are, we, are we addressing problems with freedom of speech and fundamental liberties? But that day, the, the fight against ETA started. And if you ask asking me about the, 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 the support of Palestinian terrorism that we see here in this country, probably the solution is the same. We will need to address not only the members of the PFLP, but the people that provide support openly 
to people that openly declare themselves terrorists according to the EU list of terrorist organizations. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Miriam, do you, you have anything you want to add to? Uh... Well, it, you, both Angela and uh, Daniel made it uh, difficult for me to add something because uh, you analyzed it so well. And I think um, what you analyzed uh, in Angel for Spain actually also apply, applies uh, for Germany. Um, maybe Germany woke up a bit um, after the incidents we had at the synagogue in Halle. Um, and uh, they started realizing, well, uh, these people are trying to attack the middle of, of their society. Um, and uh, I think we have a, a, a slight, a very slow change in awareness uh, of uh, these incitements uh, of, of our own de democracies. Um, I want to add one thing, and that's um, what a shift in politics that I observed over the last um, yeah, two years, I'd say already, and that's um, that many of uh, European po politicians are looking towards Israel when it comes to fighting terrorism. They realized Israel is a role model for us and in fighting terrorists, in fighting people that do attack exactly what, how we described it before, um, the, the heart of, of our democratic values. They look um, in terms of a secret service, what they're doing, but also in terms of education for civil society. And I think, um, Daniel, you mentioned that the, uh, Israel has a lot more friends that we actually believe. Often they're a bit quiet and they don't take the stake for us. Um, but with, with these developments in Europe, it changed a bit, um, at least in, in the political or among the political elite. Um, there are more that do speak up for Israel because that they see under what pressure this country is and they see how they cope with it. And now with the um, Abraham Accords, uh, we have a lot of uh, critical, skeptical people that do say, well, it's just a strategic alliance. They just did it for economic reasons. They just did it for um, having an alliance to fight Iran. But there are also voices and the, those are the, the, the people that really kind of see the, the development, the dynamics in the region or in the, in the Near East that is actually in some terms also coming directly back, backfiring to Europe. And those people, they do realize that um, the Abraham Accords are now really a chance of, of changing the stability in the region. Um, and I think um, with it, we do also have uh, the moment where we can see that actually um, how politician stands towards Israel, how they stand towards uh, Middle Eastern politics, has an effect of interior politics in each European country. Long they did not understand that bridge, um, but uh, since uh, the, the refugee crisis, more and more people stand, start to understand that. That's also a chance for NGOs uh, like uh, we are. Great. Well, I, I really, thank you so much. I, we're, this has been a really fascinating and I think necessary conversation. I'm glad at least we ended on somewhat of a more positive note with the Abraham Accords and um, with the news tonight about Morocco. And, and you know, let's hope other countries are going to join in on that uh, very soon. Um, so I really want to thank the panelists. I wish we had more time. And I hope in the near future, we'll all be able to meet in Europe again, or maybe in Israel to have these discussions in person. Uh, it's been very hard to, to do things remotely, but next year, hopefully. Um, and I wanna thank our audience out there for attending our conference. Um, and hopefully again, next year, we'll be able to see you in person and have a uh, Hanukkah Sameach.